OK. Uh, so the idea was uh, to present the big data a little bit. Eh? So uh, next year, I hope we'll have a little bit longer tutorial with hands-on on big data. So the idea would be to uh, teach you how to do big data in a simple way. Eh? So next year. This, this time is more like introduction and overview, one hour uh, slot. So, uh, and uh, basically we'll have uh, three parts. First introduction, just to introduce big data uh, from various reports uh, and so on. So this will be kind of, uh, everything will be easy. So, but this one is more like the entertaining part. Then a little bit of techniques, what kind of techniques one needs to be able to cover. Uh, so to do big data tools, the actual tools, we'll just browse through the names mostly and maybe pick some of them and some applications uh, <coughs> towards the end and well, one slide on literature. So uh, please interrupt me. Uh, I hope I'll be able to uh, uh, answer. Eh? Okay. Just first two very marketing type of slides which I took from I think IBM report on big data. Uh, so uh, what made a really a change so that today we can talk about big data but not let's say like five or ten years ago. So uh, let's pick just some of these numbers. So let's say for six hundred dollars uh, today we can drive a disk drive for uh, to store all the world's music. So this this is quite significant change, let's say, from, I don't know, 10 years ago when we were still struggling which songs to keep. <laughs> um, then we have 5 billion mobile phones uh, in 2010. So obviously mobile phones produce a lot of data and um, on all sides. Uh, well, 30 billion pieces of content shared on Facebook every month. Probably this number is even bigger today. Yeah? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, who is yeah. talking? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <coughs> I'm sure you're producing good part of this 30 billion here, you know. <laughs> uh, so um, then we have 40% projected growth in global data generated per year. Eh? So, um, and plus 5% growth in global IT spending. So all these uh, numbers are contributing to, uh, uh, to, to big data. Um, uh, let's continue uh, with some more numbers. Um, uh, let's say 300 billion potential annual value of uh, to US healthcare only. So, and healthcare nowadays is uh, one of the biggest uh, big data or data generators. Eh? Um, then uh, let's say 250 billion euro eh? uh, potential annual value to Europe's public sector. So e-government. Eh? So again, huge generator of data. Eh? Uh, and a couple of more numbers. Let's keep this because there will be more numbers. OK, what's big data? On first, on one slide. Basically, at the end, it's big data. It's similar to small data. So this is what we used to do, yeah? uh, but just bigger. So uh, most of the insights or intuitions which we, which we have when we deal with uh, uh, big data are the same as in the past. It's just we need to be careful about a couple of things like... Uh, just move to the left or right. Yeah, uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, we need to be careful about uh, things like uh, uh, scale complexity and a couple of other things. But just basic intuitions are pretty much the same. Uh, and this reflects obviously on techniques, tools, architectures which we need to use, which we will touch later on. Um, basically, um, uh, we have obviously aimed to solve also new problems uh, and some old problems uh, in a better way. Uh, uh, again, we'll come to, to this. Okay, this is one marketing slide from uh, IBM again. So they uh, characterized big data in these three V words, volume, velocity, variety. So a variety would mean 
multimodality, so variety of data which we deal with from very structured ones to non-structured ones from, let's say, ontologies on one side to signals coming from sensors and everything in between text, social networks and so on. So this would be a variety. Velocity, this is important element, so real-time aspect. So data, data is moving, so we need to be prepared uh, for this moving. And volume, obviously, big data means volume at the end. So this triple V, this is something which you will find occasionally yeah? uh, on the introductions of big data. OK, so this is one slide uh, or one uh, graph uh, just to uh, explain the hype which is going on on big data nowadays. So here I went to Google Analytics and compared four terms. Big data, data mining, semantic web, and machine learning. So these are, let's say, related, uh, these data intensive terms. So data mining uh, is uh, on the top, just it's all business intelligence, all this is kind of hidden behind this. Uh, uh, so this is living pretty, it's pretty stable going on for many years. If we would uh, extend this, it's going slightly down, but roughly it's somewhere there. Yeah? Semantic web is on the bottom. OK, we have new terms nowadays, but it's smaller industrial sector, a little bit less interest but uh, uh, on these keywords nowadays, but still it's, it's pretty stable. Yeah. Uh, machine learning is here, a little bit higher, uh, and now big data. So here is just, uh, if we would extend this, big data wouldn't exist like a couple of years ago, but let's say now here we are observing roughly one year. And you see just within this one year how big data went up. So it crossed machine learning uh, a few months ago. And with this trend, uh, it will uh, reach uh, data mining soon. So this reveals uh, at least the interest of uh, the global population on, on, on big data. So we need to be careful about this. Uh, Maybe just here's one point where uh, Obama was mentioning big data in one of his talks, then this boosted a little bit of this interest also recently. So if you as president is mentioning big data, then probably it has some uh, weight. Okay, another semi-marketing slide. So probably all of you know this Gartner hype cycle. So it's worth checking where big data is according to Gartner. So you remember on the left side, we have this upcoming technologies, uh, this more like technology triggers. Uh, so here you have everything from quantum computing to, well, the most hype stuff apparently these days would be cloud augmented reality, which is going out, social analytics, and so on. So big data is coming, according to Gartner, going up. Uh, but um, uh, what's interesting, so here you have also different signals, uh, symbols. You have triangles, which are more like 10 years to the market, uh, or 10 years to the sort of maturity. But uh, uh, let's say big data uh, has a circle, so it's only two to five. So it's really upcoming uh, technology, so which will have impact pretty soon, uh, not as much as uh, maybe some other uh, technologies. So, okay, this is just another view, uh, putting big data in the context of other technologies which are out there. Okay, <clears throat> what are key enablers for big data? Uh, all three, I guess, are uh, obvious, but still, let's mention them. So one is increase of storage capacities, uh, increase of processing power, and availability of data. So without any of these three, big data wouldn't be possible in such a form as we are discussing these days. OK, uh, let's uh, check each of those uh, on a graph. So here we are in 1986. Basically, back then, there was almost no data uh, uh, we didn't have capacity really. Yeah? But now this just exploded in the last 10 years and is going up. So another view, 
it's more like relative. Comparing analog versus digital data, you see back in 1986 it was 99%, everything was still analog. So we had just these tiny little disks, so 250k diskettes, nobody, uh, the old guys remember, yeah. Uh, and then this was uh, growing, 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 and now nowadays analog part is definitely way smaller and everything is digital. So this certainly is one uh, important enabler, the storage. Then computation capacity. Again, exponential curve, almost nothing back then this so-called we didn't even use supercomputers back then, but these huge server rooms, or even the word server was not there uh, back then. So these huge computers uh, were as powerful as mobile phones nowadays, and now this went up. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting if uh, uh, we check distribution of computing power uh, across uh, different types of devices, so we have Pocket calculate, calculators, which were, well, based on the amount of them uh, back then, uh, they were pretty significant. So supercomputers, servers, mobile phones, video games, and personal computers. You see how these proportions are uh, changing. So personal computers are uh, uh, pretty big still, but obviously they are in decline. So this would be uh, supercomputers, clouds, I guess, uh, and uh, mobile is moving, uh, or maybe I missed some of the colors. Basically, these distributions are changing, and uh, uh, it's important somehow to, to, uh, to, to be aware that uh, uh, this is growing, and also types of, uh, types of machinery which we are using nowadays are uh, different. Now, data availability was the third enabler. Uh, here is an interesting graph. So all these graphs I'm taking from McKinsey report, which I will re uh, reference, uh, which you can get for free from the uh, web. Uh, so these are industry sectors. Uh, so this is kind of estimated uh, stored data in 2009 in petabytes per, per sector. So see we have manufacturing, government, communication media and so on. Banking would be here and it's dropping down. What's interesting, uh, how much data is stored per company, per company with more than 1,000 employees in 2009. You see that uh, it's not unusual to have, uh, most of the companies would have somewhere in the range of uh, 1,000 petabytes, which is whatever it's. 1,000 petabytes. Uh, so uh, healthcare, uh, we have less healthcare institutions, but uh, on average they would have extremely big amount of data. So this is also an interesting uh, uh, dimension to check. And also now another view to the types of data. So we have, uh, this would be data modalities which we deal with. We have video, we have image, audio, and text and numbers. This is what we, we are usually uh, dealing with here. And again, we have industrial sectors, and you see more or less everybody has uh, text and numbers, and uh, obviously education, government, and media would have also some of these other ones as well. Yeah. Any idea why banking has a lot of video? Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't know, but I could guess that maybe security cameras, or surveillance. Uh, I don't know, but th this might be this might be uh, the reason. Uh, uh, what else? Any, yeah, this is the only source I could imagine why they would have video. Uh, I mean, they have money to invest, and they need to be secure, and this is. Kind of the same way, I guess, casinos would also, gambling uh, industry, they, have, they are heavy on this as well, but they, they don't appear here. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's important segment. <laughs> it just, it's not funded by government. Ones. <laughs> uh, 
here are another two graphs, which uh, basically, again, is something which uh, everybody knows uh, how social network uh, networking is still going up. What's interesting out of this graph, so the message is that frequent users are increasing. Uh, uh, the relative part of frequent users on social networking uh, is going up, um, and especially uh, also in the combination with mobile. So uh, what basically the message out of two graphs is that uh, mobile social uh, networking is something which is uh, heavy, heavily going up. Uh, this is what we are doing every day, I guess, but also non-computer scientists are doing this, so this is why this is relevant. Uh, so I don't have this graph, but uh, last year, for instance, was uh, from another study somewhere in the summer last year, uh, average time people spent on social networks, meaning Twitter, Facebook, and so on, uh, 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 surpassed the, the traditional web usage. So this was a pretty historical moment last year, uh, which not many people are aware of. Uh, so these two graphs just show um, a little bit of this. Another, <coughs> since we talk about data, so another extremely important source of big data is also uh, Internet of Things, which is Everybody knows this is going up, but this, this graph nicely shows uh, what's the projected growth. Uh, so here we have a couple of uh, areas like security, healthcare, energy, uh, industry, retail, travel, utilities, and uh, transport. Uh, and so this is the, the amount of sensors uh, in millions, I think, uh, connected nodes in million. Uh, in 2010, and this is projected for 2015. You see, this uh, this is basically exploding. It's exploding, and uh, this will be huge source of of uh, big data, I guess, in the future. Uh, what's maybe worth mentioning here? This data, since as John said, I'm in all kinds of areas. We are obviously also in this one because of the projected growth. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, was I would say status of these areas that they are at the moment they are more or less still dealing with the nodes, how to connect, how to communicate, and so on. But uh, the level of services is still pretty poor compared to the projected growth. So also for this semantic and data mining and other related communities, this will be I guess a big push in the future. Okay, so this is uh, another view to this. Okay, this is more like traditional <coughs> methodological slide. So what is big data value chain? Uh, so boring slide, but still uh, just to be complete. Uh, who are the stakeholders? Obviously government regulators. Um, and then we have, let's say, four typical phases which appear these phases appear in all data intensive areas, so generate data, aggregate data, analyze data, and consume, um, uh, consume the data or uh, whatever this analysis produces and derive some value out of it. And in all four we have, uh, well, either individuals, more like consultants, SMEs, large enterprises, uh, uh, like here we have obviously in the generate data we, we also need to deal with the uh, technology and th this kind of uh, uh, goes through all these four phases. But these are this is just one big methodological picture where we can uh, dig in into each of these uh, phases. But uh, we won't stop here too much. Huh? Um, this is, an, I think, pretty much the last graph uh, in this part. Uh, so this is also from McKinsey report. Uh, so here we have. Industrial sectors, um, and on x axis we have uh, big data value potential index. So more on the right, bigger potential uh, uh, this industry has. Um, and here we have uh, well productiv historical pr productivity growth in U.S., which roughly would uh, would be relevant also for other industrially developed countries. So, and we have four clusters. So, um, maybe quick summary. So, information technology obviously has uh, most out of it. Well, retail, uh, 
uh, this big uh, is uh, big circle. I think is health uh, and government. So uh, so this this is the area where probably the the big data will have the highest impact. So this is this kind of graphs are always discussable, but, but sort of complies with with uh, with intuition. Okay. Yep. Sorry. Uh, I just. I mean, I know there is a foot uh, footnote, but potential to what? Big data value. Uh, I guess potential to the impact which uh, indus in industries would have on, on uh, services revenue and so on. They, this, this is my understanding how this uh, probably would need to go back to report to, to uh, see the explanation of this potential. But uh, I think this is in this line. Um, so in other words, basically, if if you're a computer scientist and working in IT sector, probably you will benefit the most. So, so is it for manufacturing, my talk was, is it potential to themselves or potential to others who? Uh, well, manufacturing by definition is sort of middle, middleware uh, in this. Uh, they usually don't have the final end, end user, but they, they get something they produce. Uh, they have some process and they they put this uh, in a follow-up chain so uh, probably for industrial sectors I would guess yeah. uh, again I mean this you know the, the way how you split uh, sectors so th th that's why this graph can be discussable it's so too high level to, to be extremely specific about it uh, I think these graphs were produced through more like questionnaires over uh, mass of companies. So again, these questionnaires have its own weaknesses. So it's many things are discussable, but still, at least there's some some logic in, in this. Aha, uh -huh. and this is the message for you. Uh, so based on a couple of reports, not just this McKinsey one, uh, demand, uh, uh, demand will go heavily up in this uh, uh, big data related technologies and uh, estimated uh, lack of talent uh, uh, apparently by this uh, uh, analysis is like uh, well let's say 50 to 60 percent gap relative to uh, predicted 2018 supply so this supply means uh, who is around now who is being educated these days uh, and some others which probably will just readjust. Um, so we come to something like 300,000, I guess. Um, and uh, estimated need is somewhere up here. So uh, as, a, as an academic, would you say the universities are adapting? And if they do, do you think it's computer science that they should be adapting? Or uh, so big data, big data operates on, uh, as we saw from this methodolog methodology diagram, uh, this one. So for different uh, phases uh, or different segments of this uh, graph, you need different skills. Uh, <clears throat> so certainly generating data is very technology uh, driven. So aggregating already is, you know, can be I don't know, even social scientists or, I mean, it's already an uh, analysis and aggregating. Here is maybe a little bit of technology, but uh, uh, moving towards the right is less and less computer science and technology. So uh, I, I guess it's across several, uh, several sectors. Let's say if I would, uh, if you go to university sites, certainly, well, computer science, mathematics, you know, all these physicists, which, which are smart, but they pick the wrong uh, <laughs> topic. Um, uh, uh, and then go over this high school style of um, uh, uh, topics towards social scientists, healthcare, uh, machinery, machine engineering, obviously, for manufacturing. So uh, this gets wider and wider. But you cannot expect that. Uh, uh, Social scientists would, would deal the technology side for uh, big data. Okay, tools. Uh, 
I try to structure these well types of tools which we need to have uh, along these dimensions, which are sort of sorted uh, 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 in a more like this uh, pipeline fashion. Uh, so the key questions are first, where processing is happening, where it's hosted. So this would be, let's say, distributed servers like cloud, Amazon EC2 would be an example. Right? So processing is hosted on this kind of infrastructure. So then where data is stored? This is another important question. So distributed storage, storage is sort of answer, like Amazon S3 would be a nice example of it. Once we have processing and data uh, somewhere, then we need to have a, some type of programming model how to approach the, the uh, uh, this process, processing and data machinery. So. Uh, nowadays, as a programming model, the most hyped one, I wouldn't say that it's the most appropriate always. Uh, it's uh, uh, this map reduce, Hadoop, and so on. Uh, we'll, we'll go through these uh, uh, topics on uh, follow up slides. So, then, <coughs> how data is stored and indexed. Uh, so, once we have infrastructure and we have programming models, so what we use as a tool, so let's say, NoSQL type of databases are uh, popular nowadays, and uh, probably this will have uh, even more growth because they are they, they are certainly suitable in many ways for dealing with uh, big data. Yeah? Um, and once we have everything, even data stored and uh, accessible, we need to do some operations on top of it. So this would be then statistical packages from well. These are, well, Olim, obviously, I, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, R would be one, and uh, there, there are more SaaS and commercial ones. IBM has uh, its own set of tools and so on. Uh, now, let's go one by one, typically one slide per topic. So distributed infrastructure, we said uh, we, uh, Computing and storage are typically hosted on transparently on cloud infrastructure. So cloud would be uh, well very popular one, or one of the first one is obviously Amazon, which pretty much offers everything what I mentioned before. Uh, let's say Amazon EC2. Most of you, I guess, already touched this. Basically, you just say, well, I want a machine, and you get one. You pay a little bit. It's a little bit more expensive if you're using this for too long time, but it's really commodity. Processing power is commodity. Yeah? Google App Engine would be one, uh, and then Elastic, Beanstalk. These are a couple of names which are some more, some are less known. And in the same way, distributed storage, so the same way as for processing would be EC2, S3 would be an example of, of distributed storage which works pretty well. Yeah? Or Hadoop distributed file system would be another type of uh, distributed so, uh, storage. And all this is pretty easy to access. If you have, I don't know, $10, you can get this at least in the range of minutes or hours already of uh, processing power and then and, and gigabytes. So this is the infrastructure part. Then <coughs> um, distributed processing. So we said that. Uh, we need a little bit non-standard uh, programming models. So the traditional data programming model was, well, we had a machine, workstation, notebook. We had one threaded type of software which gets the data and uh, produces some results. So this doesn't work anymore for big data just because of scale. Yeah? And uh, so uh, in the old times, whenever it came to the problems which required some uh, distributed or parallel uh, processing uh, it was this MPI, message pr uh, passing interface, I think, MPI, uh, which was extremely efficient, was used in the supercomputing centers for calculating oh. weather, uh, differential equations, and all kinds of stuff. But everything's fine with this, except that it's expensive to write software uh, in MPI. Uh, it's hard to debug and so on. So we need something more flexible, something which uh, um, just, you know, in 
short time we can produce a solution uh, on the cost of some additional overheads, uh, but still uh, we, we try to save our time. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> So MapReduce is uh, one such hyped, uh, heavily hyped uh, approach. Um, and uh, Hadoop is probably the most popular uh, implementation of this MapReduce. Um, uh, MapReduce uh, programming model, but we have many more, Hive, Peak, and, and many others. So, uh, so next year, if you come, so we'll uh, have hands-on on Hadoop. Yeah? Uh, of course, we need to be careful with Hadoop. So although it's hyped, uh, it requires a lot of extra overhead, which uh, basically it pays off only at certain type, uh, for certain type of problems and at certain scale. So for small things like counting or sorting, probably Hadoop wouldn't be a good idea. Although technically you can do this. Is it more of a functional programming approach? Or? No, it's uh, uh, so. Uh, this is the the, the idea. It's uh, not as much uh, on the level of functional or logic or procedural. Uh, it's more like how you split, how you reformulate your problem uh, in a way where so you have input data and you try to solve something. Now the point is that you first that that's why it's called map reduce. First you map this data, basically you split the data into uh, many chunks, you solve smaller problems, uh, and then you, well, reduce these solutions, uh, particular solutions into uh, uh, final solutions. So in the old fashioned way, which almost nobody uh, is using this term anymore in this context is this divide and con conquer uh, paradigm of uh, programming. I mean, this is the underlying intuition. Uh, it's just that uh, it's nice, nicely, a formulated um, um, or a nicely, this paradigm is nicely mapped into this uh, distributed processing uh, platform. Uh, let's say uh, if you go to these distributed uh, processing conferences and or data mining or if you talk to Google guys, so usually they would have the standard algorithms reformulated in this fashion. So this would be the typical paradigm usually you wouldn't get new algorithms, it's just the old algorithms reformulated in this way and then they, they can just cover uh, way bigger amounts of data. Okay, <clears throat> another level in this pipeline we said, so, uh, so how to store the data. So high performance schema free databases, the so-called no SQL class of databases, they, these are the ones which uh, which got uh, quite popular in the last couple of years. And now, what are the typical characteristics of these uh, databases? Maybe Barry can add something to this. Uh, <clears throat> first, uh, the idea is to support large amounts of data. Most of them can really support large amounts of data. Then, why they are called NoSQL? Because mostly they have non-SQL interface, although this is even changing nowadays. I think they... they uh, so here you can see MongoDB, basically they use JSON. Uh, it's just simple enough. So nobody uh, cared you know, to spend like three days writing proper parser, so they just used the JSON parser. So this is my understanding why they have JSON. And JSON is simple enough. Then they operate on distributed infrastructures, like on the top of Hadoop. Uh, they're based on these key value pairs, so there's no predefined schema, which is, uh, of course, suitable for linked open data, which I'm sure you heard these days about. Uh, so the no predefined schema means that uh, you have no extra overheads one, uh, later on when you're, changing the, um, when you're changing the problems or adapting the problem. Uh, they're flexible and fast, obviously. Eh? You have uh, plenty of implementations. Uh, uh, well, here I forgot to mention the, the Ovlim. Uh, uh, so, plenty of implementation, new, new ones are coming, I would say. So, here is an example of a session with MongoDB. So, you run, you run Mongo, you connect. Uh, for instance, with this statement, you save name Pete, warden, eyes blue. Drop in, and with the next sentence, 
uh, you say, find me something with Pete Warden and you get back the object. So this is pretty much the whole, the whole uh, paradigm. So everything is the same as it used to be, just it works fine, uh, fast, in distributed fashion. And uh, not many services are extra analytic services and so on are on the top of it. Let's say tools like Ovlim and so on would have uh, uh, more like this lightweight reasoning on the top of it, which is already more sophisticated than many of those. Uh, but I guess the new ones are coming, which will have even, even more uh, analytical processing, aggregation, and everything what one needs to solve these problems which we mentioned before in these industrial sectors. Techniques. So <clears throat> if we talk about big data, uh, so big data by itself is not such a big problem. The problem are really operations which we want to do on the top of big data. So if uh, we just do simple counting, uh, this is not too simple counting. Uh, complicated counting can be way more uh, complex. But uh, simple counting, for instance, everybody could do with a little bit of uh, rel relatively trivial uh, piece of code. You don't need Hadoop and so on. Right? Uh, so simple counting, let's say, is not a heavy, uh, complex uh, problem. But let's say once we start do modeling or reasoning with data, of different kinds, so not just maybe structured na or web log files, but once we have texts and signals and uh, uh, multimedia, videos, audio, and so on, then of course so operations on such a data, then this gets more complicated. Yeah? Uh, and of course this uh, then requires another type of, uh, uh, th that's why big data is uh, relevant uh, to mention. Uh, we were doing big data already in the past for simple tasks. Um, what's good news about big data is that um, because of these huge amounts of data, uh, suddenly modeling techniques can, can get way simpler. Let's say one example from this semantic area is uh, in the old times when we had just a couple of assertions and a couple of rules and uh, in some first order, complicated first order languages, uh, of course, then reasoning was complicated. Yeah? Now, since we have e everything stored, basically all the instances, and we have billions of uh, triples and so on, suddenly we don't need this heavy, I mean, maybe we need it, but uh, it's uh, fascinating that we can solve a lot of hard problems just by, through lookup and with simple forms of uh, uh, reasoning. So we don't need this heavy machinery from the past to solve almost the same same problems. Same is true for machine learning or data mining. So with uh, machine learning on small amounts of data was way harder. Uh, uh, estimating probabilities, distributions and so on was way harder. Here we, we solve lots of these problems just by some kind of simplified counting and uh, just because all the data is there. Yeah. Before we had to assume that about the missing data, about the missing non-materialized links and in the case of reasoning. So this big data on one side it complicates life, on the other side just because of the size some of the problems are uh, or some methodol methodolo methodological approaches are uh, way simpler. Yeah. But we need to be able to deal with scale, obviously. Mm. Uh, so here is one uh, graph. Some of you already saw this cube, which I prepared a couple of years ago for Planet Data. But let's say, where's the how how this data data space is kind of organized? Eh? So this is one possible view. Uh, on one in one dimension, we have data modalities from heavy structured type of data like ontologies. Structured data would be more like traditional databases. Networks, social networks, for instance, would fall here under this text. So we are uh, uh, taking structure out now, out of data from left to right. Uh, text, multimedia, and signals, which is kind of free form. Um, so this is one dimension. Now. This is just data. Yeah? So now here we have the mention of operators, what we want to do with the data. Yeah? One 
operator obviously extremely important is collecting the data. So in the case of crawling, for instance, collecting would, uh, crawling would fall under collect, collecting the data. Preparing means transforming it somehow into from one form to another one. Uh, then how to represent the data. So LOD or relational database or something else. So this is another type of operation which we need to be able, or at least we need to be aware of what, what we are using uh, for each problem. Then modeling, reasoning, and let's say visualizing would be uh, at the end. So these are operators which we can apply to each of these data modalities here. Yeah? And then, uh, so these are organized in a pipeline fashion. Um, and here, these are not really organized in any particular order and these are these additional issues which we need to be able to deal with depends on the problem. So scale obviously is something streaming which we mentioned before. So uh, not all problems require response or not all problems have this uh, streaming mode. So but when we have it we need to be prepared to deal with this. Context, so not just the data itself which we observe, but we need to sometimes data need to be uh, put in a context. So this is important. Quality of data, this uh, needless to say, and usage, uh, so usability aspects uh, at the end. So these are different, uh, uh, let's say, three dimensions. Probably we could add some more. Now <coughs> uh, the idea here was, uh, let's say, if we go through the, this computer science, different data intensive computer science areas like information retrieval, data mining, machine learning, NLP, semantic web, and so on. Typically, these uh, areas of um, uh, research would be subcubes of this cube. Yeah. So if we take information retrieval, for instance, uh, uh, would be obviously operating mostly on text. They deal with, well, if you talk about search engine scale, quality usage, let's say, not so much streaming and collecting certainly would be, uh, and mo most of most of these operators would be there. So this would be information retrieval. Semantic web is a little bit more on the left side. So ontologies, structured data, uh, and uh, well, scale, context, and uh, more like represents uh, model reason. So this would be semantic web uh, subcube. So this is one view which uh, I guess explains or connects a little bit uh, different areas of research and puts them on the uh, same ground. OK, uh, now just one example uh, which we it's good to, good to understand this uh, concept. So there's one risk when we do big data mining or all kinds of other big data stuff. Um, that um, let's say if we have lots of data, huge amount of data, uh, 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 it's pretty easy to discover uh, patterns which are completely meaningless. Uh, so statisticians know about this, so they Call, I mean, through this Bonferroni principle, uh, 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 so which which is in one sentence. So, if you look in more places for interesting patterns, then your data or amount of data will support you. Typically, you would get complete nonsense. Um, and I will show one example on this. So, uh, you always need to be aware uh, what your data actually supports, and if you s try to uh, prove. Uh, claims which are uh, which are beyond the data, then it's easy to get such results, but they are completely meaningless. So here's one example from uh, this book, which I will uh, show afterwards. Um, so the task is the following: we want to find terrorists, suspicious people. Eh? Now we want to find unrelated people who appeared at least twice or uh, who appeared at least uh, twice in the same hotel on the same day. So these would be suspicious people, eh? why they are together, eh? twice. Yeah? Now we are tracking, let's say, billion people. We are monitoring this for 1,000 days, three years, three years of time. Eh? Let's say 
we say each person stays in a hotel 1% of time. This means one day in three months, which doesn't hold for us. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, hotels usually would hold like 100 people, so we have like uh, 10,000 hotels, in the range of 10,000 hotels. Now, if everyone behaves randomly, so no terrorists, no, no, no plot, no uh, conspiracy behind. Uh, will just simple data mining will detect anything suspicious or not? So this is now the question. So by intuition, so what would you say? How many people would we? How many pairs of people uh, would we find which stay uh, at least twice in the same hotel, not knowing each other? Yeah. We have an intuition. Many. Many. Zero, one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so not knowing each other. This is also uh, uh, so. This is, and we are monitoring now billion people. Just these the small groups which meet here and there. Okay, yeah. but uh, so uh, the answer is so. This is completely random. Two people which don't know each other would appear in two hotels twice yeah, in three years. Yeah. So it's two hundred fifty thousand pairs. Yeah. Uh, so this is just simple probability would give you this answer. Huh? So uh, this is just too many combinations, uh, combinations uh, to check for, let's say, intelligence services. Uh, it's just too expensive. So uh, what to do? Yeah? Uh, we need to have some additional evidence within the data so that uh, we reduce this number down to something which is meaningful and which is uh, uh, very ha verifiable, uh, at least to the degree that uh, well, we find these uh, suspicious people. Yeah. Uh, so this is kind of interesting example. So th this didn't happen in the past, you know, when uh, we had uh, small data. So uh, of course this was hard to find. Now with this huge data, it's very easy to find very interesting stuff just by purely uh, probabilistic, simple prob probability would tell you that in the, this waste, vast amount of patterns which are generatable out of the data, uh, you will always find some weird ones as well, which are completely meaningless. Uh, but they exist there because data allow to detect them. So obviously here we would need to know a little bit more about these people than just that they appeared twice in the same hotel. So this is. I gave this example just to give you intuition that uh, we need to be careful what we find out of big data. I know this is good area for conspiracy theory people. They, they will always find conspiracies in big data. In the small data, it was harder to find them. OK, so uh, we won't go too, too deep into the uh, uh, operations uh, or, or the, the uh, methods or techniques, uh, but just to give you a flavor of type of techniques which were not characteristic for, let's say, small data, but now we need to be aware of them. At least uh, we need to be able to deal with this. So one is smart sampling of data. So this is something which in a small data set uh, world didn't exist really. Yeah? So smart sampling means if we have huge amounts of data, so how to reduce this huge amount to small, smaller size without losing information content from the data. For some problems, this is easy. Yeah? We just do random sampling and it's already enough. Let's say just for simple counting or estimating simple uh, distributions, uh, uh, just random sampling would be enough. But let's say if we have graphs, for instance, eh? social networks. So social networks usually have uh, this power law distribution and so on, and we cannot, sampling graphs is non-trivial. You need to be aware of the problem which you are solving. Otherwise, you basically, if you just take some random links in the graph, basically you wouldn't get the structure which you want to mine afterwards. Eh? So. Smart sampling can be very hard for some problems and for some data types. 
another simple sampling, a sort of simple, uh, I mean simple nowadays, but let's say in early 90s we were, it was not simple for us, how to sample picture. So JPEG is a nice example of uh, smart sampling of the picture. So you have this huge image, every pixel is accurate, I mean at least what uh, camera produced, but person doesn't need this to get a message. So while well, JPEG was simple, this discrete cosine transform, basically you just uh, transform the image into a frequency space, we reduce this, uh, this low uh, uh, non-significant frequencies, uh, so this was uh, compression, then we came back from the most important frequencies back to the image and for the person uh, watching the image was the message was the same. Yeah. So this is a nice example of what's possible with the image. And the same, these MPEG formats and so on for the movies is pretty much the same. But not all data are as friendly. But still, even for the image, it was not clear, you know, for in 80s we didn't have this uh, JPEG. So uh, we had to deal with not too large files, but still was, uh, uh, compression was not easy. Yeah. It was just this run length compression. If you're very similar sequence of, of, of bits and bytes uh, was compressed, so this was the only one. Yeah. Six, seven Six, seven minutes will be okay, yeah. Uh, so this is pretty much the last slides on uh, analytical operators. So um, <coughs> on the top of these uh, previous operators, so same, uh, did I, no, I didn't go through. Yeah. Uh, so smart sampling is one important intuition which we need to be aware of. Finding similar items, we, we have small data, it's very easy So uh, to find similar data records. Uh, let's say if you have 100,000 documents and we get a new one, we try to find a similar one, we brute force would work and that's it. If we have billions and billions then this wouldn't work. So, Multidimensional indexing of data, this is very important to just to access and to get the similar items. So there's a whole set of class of algorithms to do this. Incremental updating of models. So in the, in the small data world, uh, we took the data, we built the model and that was it. And when the data changed, we just changed a little, uh, just re-ran the whole thing and it was okay. Here with the big data, we cannot afford this. So we, we need to be incremental. So small change in data, uh, we know that produces small change in the model and the algorithm needs to support this. Yeah. So this is incremental updating. Um, and uh, it's a very fundamental set of techniques, so linear algebra, which you probably all uh, know from uh, uh, undergrad courses, uh, so need to be properly, uh, you know, this, this, uh, needs to run in this distributed fashion and this is basically what Google has or this big um, search engines and uh, many of these big uh, data providers. So these are type of uh, operators which we need to have and then of course then we can uh, deal with uh, uh, with more like traditional way of dealing with the data. So on the top of these previous operators we just uh, do the usual stuff let's say in the data mining or machine learning sense this would be supervised learning, non-supervised or semi-supervised, just the traditional machine learning, classification, regression, and so on. So if we have these operators properly implemented on distributed infrastructures, then everything else is, is then the same. So this is, uh, uh, that's why I said at the beginning uh, that uh, big data is this almost the same as uh, small data. Yeah? So the same intuitions, it's just we need to be careful about the scale. Yeah? Uh, okay, to learn about uh, these techniques which I just mentioned, uh, this book recently came out, it's downloadable from the web, Mining of Massive Data Sets, so it's from Jeffrey Ullman and uh, co-author, uh, so uh, it goes through all these uh, segments and provides good good lead at least how to design algorithms or to actual algorithms uh, uh, so you can learn a lot from here. Yeah. And this is by my knowledge the only book uh, which is technical, which is technical on the algorithmic side uh, nowadays on the market. Okay, so we have just a few more minutes. I will just browse 
quickly through some of applications which are happened in my circle or which we, we were doing. For instance, one big data application which uh, we did was uh, for Bloomberg website recommendations. So recommenda if you open an article on Bloomberg.com, you would get this set of recommendations which we generate based on who is reading, what is reading, what was history of this person and so on. And this happens like 200 times per second. Uh, uh, and well, why recommendation is important? Just because good recommendation can be like, in this case, five to 10 times better than a bad recommendation. And user can stay way longer on the website, which generates, uh, in the case of this website, which has roughly 10, 10 million clicks per day, lots of revenue. Yeah. So this is kind of big data with real time element. Yeah. So response time needs to be like 20 to 50 milliseconds. Everything what's above 100 milliseconds is uh, not useful. Uh, I will skip what we track about the user here. I mean, the profile of each click is monitored heavily in along many dimensions. And uh, so that's why this, this is kind of big data. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for some people which are registered, we have also uh, demographics. Yeah, uh, this would be uh, the rest. We have history. We have a couple of other things. I mean, this is what everybody's doing. So what's available? We don't uh, we don't get any external uh, sources. Everything just things which are available through the cookie tracking and what's available from the log files. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, Similar setting was, let's say, what we did for analysis on um, for New York Times. Again, each each user is being tracked, and uh, uh, then we would like to come up with in real time with the segments of users which uh, uh, which appear, so that uh, advertise uh, so advertising campaigns can be more efficient. So the scale, for instance, here would be. Uh, roughly 50 gigabytes of uncompressed log files per day. This would be 50 to 100 mi million clicks per day. Let's say around four to six, depends on the day, uh, unique users and 7,000 pages are visited more than 100 times per day. So this is distribution of New York Times, for instance. Uh, another example from British Telecom. So here we observe British Telecom telecommunication, internal telecommunication network, like 25,000 devices. And now this problem we are solving is uh, if a problem happens in this network, so <coughs> device starts complaining, and then all devices which are connected to this device starts complaining, and then this is network effect. Now the problem is to find the root cause, the root cause, the device which is really uh, the source uh, of a problem. So root cause analysis. This is kind of probabilistic reasoning setting. So this needs to happen like in a second after the failure happens. Yeah? Is, is like the problem bottleneck for uh, cloud computing or uh, elastic, this is like the same problem? For example, you said that you are hosting in the cloud. So the cloud, Google, for example, or Elastic, they have uh, a bottleneck problem. Uh, this is more like a generic question about the cloud. Uh, uh, well, depends how you organize the, the, the problem. Yeah. Uh, uh, so if you're solving problem on Amazon, yeah, sure. Yeah. It's, uh, if you do this in a wrong way, then this can be, uh, of course, bottleneck. Uh, but really depends on the problem. Some problems are more friendly for clouds. Some are less friendly. Yeah. Uh, OK, but let's continue here. So for instance, in this case, we are solving this root cause analysis and prediction what might, and anomaly detection, what where you smell the smoke, but there's no fire yet. So, and this, this happens all on the stream. Yeah? And we have like 10 to 100 alarms per second. Yeah? Uh, another example, which, uh, so this is just this picture. So for instance, another big data, which is in the context of planet data and this couple of other projects. Uh, so we are monitoring um, all mainstream news and uh, blogs as well uh, from the whole world. So like 35,000 news uh, sources. Uh, and uh, so 
if you open this page you would uh, and click the demo you will see how these articles are just rolling so this is kind of good source of uh, of big data for all of you and now each article which we crawl from this RSS feeds gets uh, also semantically enriched so this is the text then complete semantic enrichment natural language processing linking to LOD and then this is the input so we have stream of uh, semantically annotated uh, documents uh, which were published just in last minutes pretty much yeah. okay let's keep this uh, visualization part uh, maybe just to give you an example mining so, uh, huge social networks so this is uh, work from Jude Leskovets and uh, Eric Horowitz uh, from Microsoft Research uh, so they were analyzing one month of Microsoft Messenger social network uh, so for each person basically there was a log file for each person who logged in into MSN Messenger uh, we, uh, they knew age, uh, gender, language, uh, country um, and now the questions which appeared uh, were what's the structure of this communication network so there's a little bit longer presentation on this but just give you a couple of uh, slides on this for instance this was 150 gigabytes per day compressed eh? so uncompressed was like four or five times bigger uh, for one month of data this was 4.5 terabytes uh, this was done in June 2006 uh, so it was 250 million users logged in 180 million users were engaged in some kind of conversation uh, 7 million new accounts were uh, created uh, and more than 30 billion conversations happened so this is the scale of a social network like MSN messenger which uh, uh, well you can imagine that uh, this is nowadays uh, uh, even bigger when you deal with the Facebook data yeah? so well and then they were aggregating and doing all kinds of stuff uh, for instance this is uh, uh, who talks to whom based on a country so there's some obvious patterns like uh, uh, you would have clusters of South American countries Spain with connecting uh, being connected uh, people from Spain talking to South American countries then we would have Taiwan Hong Kong obviously Turkey Germany most obvious connection eh? uh, and France and Morocco and so on so this would be kind of uh, uh, typical now let's say untypical pet pattern was uh, <clears throat> if we uh, took into account uh, conversation duration for how long people were talking then the graph uh, suddenly got different and uh, well this was a surprise for everybody back then uh, that uh, these Arabic countries are obviously using this MSN messenger for um, very uh, long conversations uh, which uh, okay uh, uh, you see the weight on that part of the uh, graph uh, and there are a couple of new patterns which were not uh, uh, in the previous graph. Uh, so maybe uh, so this uh, if you plot this uh, amount of conversation uh, so for each uh, login pretty much you know IP out of IP you can uh, get uh, through this geo IP service uh, dot where the user appeared so basically you get the shape of the uh, uh, all the co continents and uh, uh, well some continents are a little bit emptier uh, but mostly you get the coastal regions pretty well covered eh? Australia is also very nicely covered with, on a coastal region um, this is just for Europe see Germany UK and so on Spain a little bit less Slovenia well covered Bosnia a little bit less uh, Greece somewhere down there uh, Scandinavia the coastal regions eh? uh, okay so the uh, the main result out of this piece of research uh, uh, was the following probably you know about this Mil Milgram experiment from 60s um, when this Milgram made an experiment what's the average length of uh, this social connectedness so if you pick two random people uh, in a society how many steps uh, 
you need to make so that, uh, let's see, if I know John and John knows uh, Chris and Chris knows uh, CEO of uh, IBM, so then I'm on a, a, a distance one, two, three, yeah, to this guy. Yeah? So back then, uh, this Milgram made this uh, experiment with uh, letters which he sent randomly and then in, on average six, in six steps letters came to the, to the, uh, to the person who, uh, which uh, uh, was the, well, the target person. Uh, now, uh, Jure and Eric uh, repeated this but on this 250 million database. So till 2010 this was uh, uh, the uh, experiment which uh, was uh, confirmed this number from 60s on the largest uh, social network possible uh, uh, till then now uh, last year they repeated this on Facebook and they pretty much uh, confirmed the number apparently the number is going down so here you see so if you take MSN messenger you pick two random people out of MSN messenger and try it and esti estimate uh, what's the number of steps you you need to make from two random uh, between two random people you would come to 6.6 uh, .6 basically which is in the same range as Milgram uh, said back then. Uh, apparently these uh, networks are nowadays because of social networking uh, sites and so on uh, densifying so this number is uh, apparently going down nowadays. We cannot reconfirm this because we don't have all this data as Facebook. Okay, just last uh, two slides. So literature on big data, uh, which is uh, worth checking. So I took uh, these graphs from the first part of the tutorial from this McKinsey report. So this is this book. This is this IBM's book, which is also downloadable for free from the website, uh, which gives good introduction into some things, but uh, in the second part, it's more like ibm -y <coughs> style of book. Uh, well, if you want to learn about Hadoop, there's, there are many books about Hadoop. Maybe these two would be a little bit more exposed, but it's hard to say. So Hadoop has many books. Big data glossary, here are just the terms explained, not much really. Uh, the same is this book and uh, so there's a, there, so this book on mining massive data sets from Ullman, Jeffrey Ullman I mentioned before and sc scaling up machine learning. This is also one book on uh, uh, scalable analytics. Yeah. Probably some more books could be added here but uh, th there's not much out there to be honest. Yeah. Just to conclude the last slides, uh, so big data is pretty much everywhere. I guess uh, we just need to get used to deal with this. Uh, big data hype, as you saw, is pretty recent. Uh, growth seems to uh, be going up still uh, and there's evident lack of experts. So this is certainly something where it's worth to invest to. Uh, what's the can we deal with big data without big investment? So the message, my message is yes, we can. Uh, so there are many open source tools, computing machinery is cheap nowadays. I mean, already machines which you can buy for five, 10,000 euro, they are uh, extremely strong compared to what, let's say we had 10 years ago. So this is commodity machines you can be used already for uh, big data. And uh, well, the key is really the knowledge how to deal with uh, data. Uh, and uh, well data is the last bit where to get data well we can get pretty big chunks of uh, data for free like uh, well Wikipedia would be one uh, we can get uh, what's called commoncrawl.org so you can get web crawl for free uh, which was not the case in the previous years uh, so you can get data nowadays uh, in the past this was harder uh, or we can buy this uh, like uh, Twitter, uh, which is far from uh, cheap. Yeah, so it's actually very expensive. Um, <coughs> so this is it. Um, uh, this is the last slide. Uh, I'll be around today, I guess. Uh, if there's some urgent question, uh, I'm here. Uh, You're here tomorrow.
Yeah, yeah, I'm here for the next uh, eight days. Uh. Okay. <coughs> so let's um, thank uh, Martha.